Um, question for all of you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm going to do a crash course in learning theory. So again, I was a head instructor at my host labs, um, but a bit about myself. Um, a large part of my background, um, I was largely self-taught. So I dropped out of UBC, ironically I got hired by UBC, uh, but through that period I was working there, I had to teach myself a lot of different skills that I wasn't really um, equipped with. And uh, eventually, it was the same sort of path for me when I was learning to become a programmer as well. So Dayboard started as sort of like a side project for me to learn how to program, and it ended up being like our core business. Um, but there's always been this, this question that I've been trying to figure out, which was, how do you know if you've known something? How do you know if you know something? How do you know if you've learned something? Right, so take a moment to just think about it to yourself. And um, you know, you might have different answers, and um, for me, I was kind of like curious about what that answer was because when I was teaching at Lighthouse Labs, one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was we got to see a lot of junior developers come in, people that had no backgrounds in, in programming at all, go from zero to a place where they were competent enough to um, teach themselves how to code from that point on. So how do you go from zero to that place? And I had the opportunity to watch that happen over and over and over again. So, um, question for you guys. How many of you guys are actively uh, learning a new skill right now? Like, could be like a like mark. Okay, everyone. Okay, so, um, all right, different different question. So, how many of you guys are actively teaching something right now? So, it could be teaching a kid something. Could be teaching your mom how to use a smartphone. Teaching a course. Teaching an employee. Great. So, this course is kind of this, this topic is kind of made for you because um, when I was trying to figure that out for myself, I was trying to dig into uh, what learning actually meant. And of course, it's hard to talk about that if you don't look at how memory works. So for all the psych majors out there, there's gonna be a bit of a review for you, but if you wanna look at how memory works, memory works in three phases. Um, the first phase is perceive, right? And what this basically means is that um, you're using your sensory input, you're taking sensory input and you're collecting data, right? So for all of us, we're using our five senses, and um, that's where all memories start. But the next phase is storage or encoding, and that part, that phase, is where two things are happening. One, you're remembering a lot of this information, but you're also discarding a bunch of useless stuff. Right? So for example, I'm physically standing here, and there's a lot of sensory input that's going on right now. There's stuff going on in the background, there's stuff outside, and hopefully you're, you're paying attention to me, and you're, and you're hearing my voice, and there's some sensory input here, but you're discarding all this other information. Okay? And this is like the second phase. And this is actually a really important phase, because a lot of us think that this is where learning happens. But that's not exactly true. And for that, let's look at the third phase which is recall. And this is the phase where you actively sort of remember or uh, draw upon the same sort of like information that you took earlier and you're repeating it in some way, shape, or form. And this is the phase where learning happens, okay? So by redefining what, what learning means, um, it means that as a teacher or as someone that's learning something, I have a phase that I could sort of look forward to as a way to know if I'm learning something or not. And this might be interesting or it might be not, but the implications of this is that it has implications on what happens on the teaching side. And it doesn't matter if you're teaching yourself, if you're teaching your user something new, or if you're um, teaching somebody else something. Uh, because there's actually three distinct phases as well. So if you want to understand the teaching process, um, the, first pro the first sort of a step to that is that there's a, there's a process for show and tell, where you're the sensory input for the other side. Right? For example, like I'm here telling you there's some sort of like learning theory here going on. Um, and that's like where that starts. Um, but the next phase is you have to sort of explain what that process is. And explanations, explaining what explaining is, um, my favorite way of explaining what that is, is um, it's when you're drawing connections to things that people already understand. Okay, so when you're drawing connections to things people already understand. So for example, like um, if I'm trying to teach my mom like what Twitter is, right, that might be something that's new for her. Um, but for her, she might understand what text messages are. And I might say, well, text messages are, so tweets are basically when you're texting, but instead of sending to one person, you're sending to a bunch of people all at once. And that's just something that you can, you can grasp onto. And that's what you want to do when you're explaining something, which is also why it's really difficult to teach kids something, because their understandings and their models of the world are very limited, and there's a few things that they can draw upon. And finally, the third thing you can do as a teacher is you can be a reference for somebody. And that's when they understood something, but they can't actually remember that thing that you've taught them, and you actually need to be there to them to fact check for them. And that's basically for the third stage. So this process of show and tell, explaining, and referencing is basically what you're doing as you're teaching somebody something new. And it doesn't matter if it's you teaching yourself, again, to your users, or teaching somebody else something. That's the stages that we're walking through. 
So some tips. I mean, this is like nice in theory, right? But like, how do I actually put this in practice? So again, if you understand that this is the goal of learning is to recall something uh, verbatim or um, remember what the source information was, um, this is something you guys can try tonight. So for a lot of us, as we're here meeting a lot of different people, we're learning about different products and services that people are working on. One thing that you could do is you could try to repeating um, what that product or service is back to the other person. So a conversation might be like, hi, my name is so-and-so, this is company A, B, and C, and we do X, Y, Z. And then at the end of that, you'd be like, okay, so um, if I understood that correctly, this is what you do, and you would, you would repeat that. And then that way, you can sort of find the gap between what you understood versus what the source material was. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Any questions? So the question was, do you have anything other than the three by five cards? Um, I'm not sure I understand what, what, I, well, what you mean by that. Can you explain that again? If you're trying to remember something, one of the ways to do is put it down on a, on a card, and then you've got flashcards, you can go through to learn things, right? The actual content itself. Right, OK. So, um, so his question was, so um, one technique that people do is they write down things that they're trying to remember on flashcards, and then they'll kind of like go over that. Um, do we have other other techniques for that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, techniques or tools. Or sure. Okay. So um, I would say that. So that would be an example of where you're writing something down because you're trying to practice your own recall for it because you're you're trying to remember like um, what. So let's say you have a keyword that you're showing on your card and you're trying to say, hey, do I remember what this material is? And you're trying to repeat that, right? Um, what's missing there is you're missing a reference on the other side. So for example, if you had like a textbook that you could like reference, sure, that makes sense. But what if it's like a teacher or, or, an, or, or some video that you have on the other side? Something that happens in conversations um, that we could do. For example, like the, the example I gave above uh, before was if you're talking to somebody about their company or product, that's your source material. So what you want to look for in that situation, what you don't necessarily have with a flashcard, which is with yourself, is you don't have a way to uh, see the difference in the gaps of your knowledge. For example, if the company, if the person is saying that the company does, you know, three things, one, two, and three, are you able to draw all three points or are you only talking about two points, right? But the person that, if, if he's there, he's able to say yes, and there's also this other thing. And that's what you want to sort of like close. Does that kind of make sense? Sure. Cool. Yes. Tips for video courses. Okay, so again, this is not a situation where you're you're missing the other um, conversation on the other side. Um, so the the okay, so vi tips for video courses. Uh, is there a topic that you're thinking of? Okay, so video courses again. It's one medium where you have um, someone explaining to you a certain topic. Um, are you talking about tips for remembering that kind of material or tips? tips for this is just Student can close out loop. Okay, so well, um, for the student. Okay, so from a student's perspective, one of the very the most important things that you have to do first, if, whether it's video materials or, or text materials, is you have to have high quality input on the other side. So it's what I'm talking about is about remembering something or learning something, but none of that would matter if you're learning something that isn't that helpful. So the first thing you have to do is actually filter out good information from the bad, especially from, from you know, an internet, there's a lot of different sort of like people giving advice or topics and stuff like that, right? So having a way to filter that is a, is a, uh, is a first step. But the second phase is um, having a way to recall that on your own. And oftentimes that could mean applications and different uses, which is why projects uh, where you're actively using material that you've learned and um, are able to use in your next current project is a lot more, um, I guess like better or easier for you to remember than things that you sort of like read about and don't have a way to, um, to implement. But I think the key difference is recognizing the difference between you listening to that material and thinking that you've learned it because otherwise you have this place where you confuse recognition with understanding. And you read it and you're like, oh, I got this. And you gloss over it. And then when it comes to like an exam or something like that where you actually have to recall it, that's when you feel like there's, there's a gap. That's what you want to watch out for. I'll take one more, yes. How do you apply these principles in day work, uh, day by day? Good question. So the question was, how do I apply this kind of thinking into Dayboard? So just a bit of a background. Dayboard is a, is a task management product 
And uh, what we do is we kind of take behavioral science and we take um, some of the learnings and research from that and finding ways to translate that to help knowledge workers be more effective. So the thing that I'm trying to get people to teach, for example, um, is we're trying to get people to understand the difference between what's efficient versus what's effective, right? Because for knowledge workers, for like say, let's say for um, production workers, if you're if you're working in a factory, like the, it's it's easy to quantify um, the amount of work that you produce. But for knowledge workers, if you're trying to make a marketing campaign or if you're trying to do like you're trying to run your business, it's very different because some days you work for ten hours and you don't feel like got anything done. But other days you do like two hours and you're like, yeah, that was a great day. But what's the difference? The difference is effectiveness. So in ways where we help people learn that um, isn't to explicitly say that, but to get them to have the behavior they want them to do, which is basically to help them think about, of the 40 things I need to do, what's actually important? So for example, in Dayboard, one of the things that's different about our product versus other um, traditional task manager products is that you can only write five tasks at a time. Okay? Well, with a, t with a task limit for today, you can only do five items at a time, which means you've got 40 things. You have to think, okay, of the 40 things, which one do I have to prioritize? In effect, the end result is you pick things that are only important to you and you ignore everything else. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So getting to think about what kind of behaviors we want and then finding ways to translate that into a feature that the end result is what we actually want them to have. Uh, I think that's it, but I'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Okay.